everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, you know, when I first came to Huddersfield in 2008, my first talk, I think probably around this time of the year, was about my third opera. So I'm going to talk about my fourth opera, Tree of Crows, and I feel in some ways this is a <laughs> bit of a full, full circle. I think at the time I said uh, that I've written an opera every seven years, and that's continued to be true. So <laughs> I don't know what that really means. It seems symbolically rich. OK, so um, yeah, this is, a, this is an opera, Tree of Codes. It was premiered in April this year, so it's still quite fresh. And I just came out of another session talking about two recent works premiered in September. So today I really feel I have a chance to kind of, I don't know, <laughs> share a lot about what I've been, been up to. Um, back in 2008, I said this, the same thing, and it, and it still pertains. Opera for me is a form of examining a cultural space, a place for heightened experience and transformation, like Artaud, um, the French surrealist writer, theatre director, um, like his appeal to theatre as a double of reality that awakens the subconscious and extraordinary states, opera for me is a place of ritual, of possession and ecstasy. And I've explored that in various ways in the uh, work that I've made. Back in 93, I wrote an opera based on the Oresteia, uh, Aeschylus' Greek trilogy, um, in which the characters of the past uh, rise up from the floor and possess the singers and also the musicians who channel different fragments of the story. Possession comes in a different form in the second opera that I did, Moon Spirit Feasting, based on Chinese rituals, trance rituals, and also a kind of um, retelling of Chinese folk tales as a kind of um, song competition. That's the play within the play of this opera in which the Monkey King and the Queen Mother of the West compete to uh, assert their version of the story of Chang'e, the moon goddess, the third figure behind. And then the opera that I wrote in 2008, hi Erin, um, The Navigator also looks at um, states of uh, states of possession, states of transcendence, uh, and performance as a way of channeling energies uh, in different ways. So that's kind of uh, a, a kind of the scope of the, the work that I've done explored through really kind of very, very diverse uh, stories, myths, um, frameworks. And this most recent opera, Tree of Codes, uh, takes, yeah, takes another, another kind of angle on these themes. So, um, First of all, this is an opera that um, dates from 2013 to 15, but actually its genesis uh, goes all the way back to 2010 when this book was uh, published, Jonathan Saffron Foe's uh, Tree of Coats. Um, it was uh, put out as a kind of guardian Christmas gift event. <laughs> and when I read about it, and saw these uh, amazing pictures, this cutout book, I immediately had to get it um, and, and um, immediately began pitching this idea of making opera to Musique Fabrique and a number of festivals. And it took all that time, it took five years to really bring it to fruition, uh, or six years really. So um, it's based on uh, as I said, the J Jonathan Safran Foer, which itself is based on stories by Bruno Schulz, and it has a number of other texts. It's scored for two main singers, 16 musicians. Um, one of them, Carl Rosman, who's the clarinetist of Musique Fabrique, a lot of people know here, also sings, and in fact all the musicians sing in the choir. Uh, it's a work which really activates the whole uh, ensemble as performers on the stage space. And it takes place in this in-between zone, this, this zone of um, enchantment, the zone of possession, uh, the zone of ecstasy, if you like. And it's set uh, in a man's last day of life, or actually a kind of extra day of life that's bolted on to the calendar of time. And the setting for the premier production is a research laboratory 
in which the workers have turned back time, unbeknownst to this man, to give him this extra day. And this, this extra day is this alternative reality in which the boundaries between humans and animals and objects are blurred. Humans sing like birds and speak through musical instruments. The father, whose research obsession is birds, turns into a bird. He's also turned into a cockroach uh, and other things. And the recurring riddle asked in the opera is, is the existential question. How do we know we are alive? What is the legacy of our life? How can we more intensely experience the flux of our life in the face of death? Okay, big questions. So, um, one of the things, okay, let me just show you the bit of detail of the book. So, it's, um, it's based on existing stories by the Polish author Bruno Schulz, and you can see it's a cutout so that um, on every page the landscape of the um, text changes, and you can look through um, the pages. Uh, up to five or six pages to glimpse um, parts of the story that occur later. So there's a real sense of simultaneous stories, simultaneous temporal um, points which are at play in a, in a kind of constellation as you, every time you turn the page. You can in fact read the book by just slipping a, a piece of, um, <laughs> just by slipping a piece of paper. And then you can, you can really see there, yeah, mm -hmm. what's left is just a, a couple of words, mm -hmm. a couple of phrases. And then you get a very different sort of experience, <coughs> like this, mm -hmm. yeah, where you see this multiplicity, this absolute complexity of, of text. Um, and to give you an example, um, if we see these words that are left through the cutout tree of codes. How that's made is just by filtering out the title of the original book, Street of Crocodiles. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so it's the same process actually for the, for the entire artifact that this is. So, um, yeah, so Street of Crocodiles, um, first published in 1934. Bruno Schulz is part of that a uh, group of um, early 20th century, uh, part of the Jewish literary world of the early 20th century. He was killed during the Second World War. He had a, a kind of, um, uh, almost like Weben, he was killed by an SS officer. Uh, and much of his work was destroyed. A uh, much more well-known writer, of course, is Franz Kafka, but there's a lot of similarities between Schultz's work and Kafka's this world of transformation, of metamorphosis, this, you know, where a man wakes up as a, as a cockroach in the morning, as in, in um, Kafka's metamorphosis. Um, and in a way, the, the richness of that background is quite filtered out by the saffron fire. The sensuality of the original text is quite overwhelming. It's really saturated with um, sensory images and colours and this kind of very ornamental writing. And Saffron Foa's kind of filtering just kind of makes it much more abstract. So what I did in my libretto was to make a further selection um, of um, both the Saffron Foa and also the Bruno Schultz. I actually made the libretto myself. Um, and one of the things I was really going for in terms of the approach to the text and also the, the, the form of the opera was this idea of the multiple constellations of lives that can be accessed at any point. Um, that one can just by turning around see a completely different world, accidentally open a door and stumble into another reality. Um, and so the, the basic idea for the opera was this this idea that there are, it's possible to create a perforation, to make holes in the fabric of reality in the world uh, and to encounter these, these multiple, um, multiple realities, multiple forms of perception, multiple forms of, um, uh, multiple viewpoints, if you like. 
Okay, just to give you a bit more background there, I'm going to show quite large slabs of the opera because I think that's, that's really the only way to, to kind of convey um, the work. There are two, as I said, there are two main singing roles. There's the son, um, who is, is the main character in, in all of the, in the, in the two books, and a woman, Adela. Um, and there's also this character, the mutant bird, that's played by Carl Rosman in the production. There are also four silent actors. There's the central figure of the father, who is this kind of obsessive um, figure. He's silent, but it's like all of the action and all of the sounds rotate around him. He's, he's like this, this pole around which everything else is revolving. There's the doctor who accompanies the father, and in some senses is the double of the son. There's another actress who's the double of Adela, the woman. Um, she starts as a plant in the opera who comes to life and then swaps roles with Adela. So there's this, this big thing in the work which is about doubles and exchanges of roles in, in terms of the transformation. Uh, and the fourth actor is a cleaner um, who later becomes a, um, a pile of rubbish. So again, another, another example of the, um, the sense of the boundaries between objects and, and you know, animated and inanimate animate and inanimate things being quite blurred. Uh, as I said, it's a, the setting is a research laboratory. The workers are the musicians, and they're there to uh, investigate their instruments. It sounds like some kind of ref report, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's more than that. Um, and there are many unusual instruments used. So this was part of, a really big part of the, um, the work that I did in um, preparing for the the opera working with musicians as they developed um, a number of double bell instruments. This is Marco Blau with a double bell trumpet. <coughs> so you've got the, um, let's just ignore that, that bit for the moment, that's the trumpet. <laughs> and another bell um, which can be accessed through trigger. So it's like there are two possible sound sources. This happens to be a whistle, um, like, a, you know, like one of those whoopee whistles, which um, is connected to one of the um, piston um, tubes, also accessible, accessible by a valve. So this is actually um, used in one part of the, um, of the opera and is a kind of orchestration of this multiplicity of, multiplicity of worlds that I'm exploring at different levels. Um, another example of this bell theme comes out in the use of the stroviol. Um, so this is an instrument used in um, known as a recording instrument from the 20s. Uh, so you have the, um, you know, before, before microphones work so well, the, the possibility of focusing the sound with, with a, a bell. Uh, so there's no body, it's just, it's just the, um, yeah, you've got here, in fact, two bells for, for the, the viol. Um, it's also known as a, uh, a folk instrument, Romanian folk instrument. So that's, there's, a, there's a kind of rich set of resonances there in terms of the um, Eastern European um, connection of this instrument, but also this sense of, of you know, evoking the past, this um, sense of um, you know, sound heard through a sort of sepia, sepia veil. Okay, and what else can I say? Okay, I'm going to play um, the trailer. So it's a three-minute trailer. It gives you kind of a over, quick overview of the work. Uh, and later I'm going to play sort of actual sections of uh, different acts of the opera. So I've mentioned the, the two singers, the son and Adela. There are four actors. There are musicians on stage. The conductor is a, um, dressed uh, and appears as a homeless man who just kind of wanders onto the stage at the, <laughs> at the beginning. Um, <laughs> His name is Clement Power, really extraordinary um, London-based conductor. His transformation uh, in, into this into this figure was, was you know, kind of quite extraordinary. <laughs> uh, but it was one of the ways in the production of trying to create a kind of seamlessness between you know, the trying again to examine um, and break down or blur boundaries between life and art. So you have this cleaner on stage who's just picking up rubbish, and then this homeless man wanders on stage. Um, and so there's this, this kind of the overture, if you like, is this kind of somehow a suggestion of this blurring and then 
the workers come into the come into the um, onto the stage space and the opera begins. But let me just play you the trailer just to give you a bit of a flavour of the work. Hier gilt es einzutreten in ein geheimnisvolles Bühnenlabor, in dem sich Sänger, Musiker und Darsteller gleichermaßen der Erforschung von Herkunft um, okay, so, so the opening act is, sets the scene really, it's this, this laboratory scene, people are getting on to their work, um, that's the, the figure of the father who comes to visit the lad. Uh, the second act, this is the beginning of the second act, there's some kind of atmospheric disturbance, the comet has passed and is interfering with the, you know, electrics of the space. Um, everything becomes a lot stranger, this plant, I think, this is the plant that's come to life, she was this mound of green um, before. Mm -hmm. uh, the father is turned into a bird and he's killed in the process. There's a funeral procession. by the sound of a comet, which I'll talk about, and these brass instruments. Wunderliche Geschöpfe bestimmen das Geschehen. Die Grenzen zwischen den... You can see the father's turning to a cockroach, but the, before that, um, after, the, after the funeral procession, there's this very bizarre conversation in... Polish and English, where <coughs> questions are asked. Um, is my father alive? No, he's dead. But does he know? No, he doesn't guess. Why doesn't he guess? And so on and so forth. So it's this, um, it's this flipping through different, um, different realities in that, which kind of underpins the, um, the text for the, for, the whole, um, for the whole work. Um, at the end, the son confronts the legacy of the father, <laughs> um, and I'll talk a bit about that specifically when we when we get to that. But what I want to do is to trace a number of paths of transformation in the work um, and show how rather ordinary everyday materials, particularly field recordings, um, make their way into the into the work and and create this kind of vocabulary of this dream world. So um, there are a number of sort of found objects in terms of field recordings. There's birds, there's the sound of motorcycles, the wind, a comet. And I look for multiple meanings and resonances of these things um, in the course of the opera. So the field recordings, um, for me, this is, this is one of the access points to um, thinking about this, this idea of perforations in the ordinary. Um, there are two um, particular um, birds that I used as the basis. The, the opera actually begins with the sound of both of these birds. Um, and these were field recordings made by the composer David Lumsdane, the Australian composer David Lumsdane, who's based in York. Um, Michael knows them very, very well. Uh, they, are, they sort of operate on multiple levels for me. On the one hand, they are for me really the sound of childhood. You know, when I hear these, when I hear these sounds, they, they really just take me back to, you know, long Australian summers. Uh, but then there's the actual um, sounds of, of, the, um, of the birds and what that offers musically. Let me play you, first of all, okay, this is the field recording for the opening of the work. And what you hear first are the bellbirds, these very high-pitched, piercing, bell-like tones, and then the magpie, which is like pure electronic music. <laughs> so that's the bellbirds. Okay. 
Um, then you also hear the sound of trail bikes, because in Australia you don't have birds without the bikes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, yeah, okay, bell minor birds, very kind of um, direct transposition into the opera, the, the pictures, E, E quarter sharp, F, uh, they be, they're, they're the, um, the kind of bridge which goes from bird to instrument, very, very um, simple in a way. Uh, they also are the basis for a kind of spectral approach to harmony, in which I find that you know, location, location of those pictures in relation to different harmonic spectra. Um, the, the birds are also the basis for various kinds of gestural vocabularies, these kind of flourishes that happen in the magpie, for instance, find their way into the, into the sonic vocabulary, different ways, the, the pulsing repetition of the bellbirds. Um, and I developed the theme of the bird at the sonic level um, in terms of cultural reference as well. So, for instance, the mutant bird character in the opera um, actually speaks a bird whistle language, and there are, not, there are about a hundred of these languages in the world. And um, the particular one I focused on is from Kuskoi. It's a Turkish whistled language um, from the northeastern coast of the Black Sea, and it's... it's um, employed actually for the same reason that birds whistle, which is to broadcast over um, vast, you know, like far dis distances and to, you know, choose a particular sonic niche to make that broadcast. Um, so that's, that's, that was a kind of really interesting um, area that, you know, kind of sub area that I looked into when I was researching stuff for the opera. Um, let me show you an example of what happens to that sound? So as I said, the opera begins, for me, the, act, the sort of emotional access point or the portal is with the bird sounds at the beginning, at the beginning of the day. The opera sort of takes like one whole day. Um, but this is where, um, this is where the sound goes later in the work. It's dropped by three octaves and it becomes this. Is my father alive? Yes, dead. Does he guess? No, he doesn't guess. No. turns them into sonar-like signals um, or perhaps the beeping of machines in the operating theatre. Um, so, you know, in, in many um, cultures, birds are associated with myths um, in relation to the, to the dead. Um, birds that carry the souls of the dead, birds that act as messengers between um, the underworld and, and um, the living. So um, this is a, yeah, so for me it's, it, it's a, a really kind of rich uh, point of transformation at, at each part of the opera. Um, and so in this scene you have the, the sun beginning 
beginning this conversation, is my father alive? Um, does he know it? Does he guess? Um, and he's addressing, yeah, this, this kind of set of puppet, puppet masks. Um, so this is a this is kind of a moment which is really like an emblem of um, the or key of the the key question of the of the opera. Okay, so from birds, um, another sound recording. Oh no, let me sort of play a little bit of Act Two, where father transforms into a bird. So this is a little segment where you can see um, where some of that bird, bird imagery goes visually. much longer slabs uh, pretty soon. Okay, another um, example of, a, of the reel, uh, which is then um, both inserted and transformed in the, in the work, is the sound of a comet, you know, which is, which is really kind of improbable, isn't it? So <laughs> this is a recording. Um, it's, it's made available as a, as a you know, kind of open license thing um, from, as it says, European Space Agency's Rosetta mission. Um, where the movement of gas bubbles was um, recorded as data uh, and then um, transformed, I mean, this is, this is like, tran you know, transposed many octaves in order to um, be heard as a sound recording. Uh, and like the sound of birds, there are different levels of, of meaning in terms of the transposition um, of, of this, you know, sound object. There's this cosmic dimension of this comet traveling through space that's referenced in the text of the opera, um, which accompanies the scene of the father's funeral procession, which you've got a glimpse of before. And you hear, you hear this, this bubbling percussive um, sound of the comet. Let me just play that to you. This is what it says. birds as a sonic material for transformation, this, this bubbling, repetitive um, quality that's found in that recording finds its way into different levels of the, um, of its, of a, of the musical manifestation. One of them um, is in a chorus of wood blocks, which uh, accompanies the crowd, this mob that uh, want to kill the birds, that throw stones at the birds and attack the father, so you have these, these sounds of uh, massed um, um, attacks on woodblocks. Later the woodblocks come back, again it's the crowd, and the woodblocks are played with rasp sticks, so that's serrated sticks that creating this kind of croaking, uh, croaking world of insects and frogs, again referenced in the text. 
Uh, and this, this accompanies the section where the fathers turn into cockroach. So this is this real kind of lower world. You've, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of real um, kind of sonic signaling. On the one hand, you have this cosmic dimension, the traveling millions of miles above Earth, and then this kind of really uh, intimate layer of, of the insects right, you know, right, at one's, right at one's feet. So, yeah, on the one hand, intergalactic perspective of the comet, and then this lower realm of, um, of the Earth's ecology. And yet, out, out of the sound of these insects, with these rust sticks on the blocks, we also hear trace of a rhythm that belongs to the text, um, Goethe's text, in fact, from Der Ilkernisch. And, um, well, one of the most famous um, poems, of course, uh, is chanted by these good blocks. So they, they make those rhythms, they speak the poem, Herr Reitet so spät durch Nacht und Wind, on these, on these wood blocks. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason for that is that um, there's a really strong connection to Bruno Schulz. Um, he writes, he actually, one of his short stories deals with this poem and recounts the story um, of his father and the son traveling through the night, um, uh, met by death, you know, unable to escape death. It's quite, you know, powerful, powerful stuff. Um, uh, yeah, so, so there, there are a lot of things in that complex. On the one hand, you have this interest in um, a found object, yes, this, the sound of the comet. It becomes an access point for a, a, a way of um, tracking or navigating a very rich uh, narrative field and cultural field um, in the sources, in Bruno Schultz, also in the Saffron Foa. It guides my selection, both of text and of musical materials. So there's a real kind of um, um, triangulation, I guess, of um, found elements, textual sources, uh, cultural references um, that make up the dramaturgy of the work. Let me... S okay, so... Where are we with this? Okay, so I'm going to play the um, first lab of Act 3. So... You're seeing from where the father, the, the section before, the father has had a bird mask and um, dies. And um, then there's a funeral procession. The musicians, um, the, what must be, you know, kind of one of the most demanding doublings, which orchestral players would never dream of doing, um, lift the father up and, and process, process with him. Um, that's the first part of this act. Then there's the dialogue in Polish and English, this idea of the secret operation, where time is turned back, where one cannot be sure whether you're alive or dead, or in which land you're alive or dead. Um, and then out of that, um, the next element is a lullaby. So that actually, the, the structure of this work is actually there are a number of, after, after these first two parts, there are actually three ballads. Um, there's, um, well, it, it's kind of a way of accessing um, the, the sort of fairy tale quality of the Goethe, of Goethe's De Elfenic. So the soprano, Adela, she sings this lullaby, she sings, let me tell you a story. And it's, and it's this kind of rocking, innocent, um, very simple melody with, uh, accompanied by um, thumb piano, and then of course, of course, it starts to turn strange, it starts to turn a bit nasty. Um, and she recounts the story of the crowd that throw, um, throw stones at the birds, um, the birds which do not recognize the father even though he may have made them, so on and so forth. Um, the second ballad is called the Boat Song. Um, and again, it has this element of quite quite a naive surface in, in, in some of its elements, the sense of the, um, um, you know, the, the, the simple kind of rocking, rocking rhythm is transposed here into this idea of um, um, 
the, the boat as a vessel for journeying. Um, it's a very large section where there's a solo bassoonist um, who accompanies the sun as he sings of um, the kind of transformations of death. He asks questions about death. Um, he asks questions about what reality is and what we mask in reality. Uh, he talks about madness. It's all really cheery. <laughs> And then the last part of the section is another ballad. So the soprano comes back, and it's the ballad of the insects with the rust sticks. And you hear at the end this, this dialogue with the rust sticks chanting section, sections of the Goethe and the soprano as well. Um, so it's it's uh, they're kind of different layers of fables, fairy tales um, that that are kind of nested in this um, in this whole section. Uh, that takes you into into the for me it was this way of, of accessing these different different layers of reality. So I'm going to play all of Act Three. It's about 20, 20 minutes, just to really give you a, a, a sense of, of how it comes together in, um, in this production. That's the comet sound.
crafting the sounds and the kind of language um, behind, I mean like every step there's a lot of detail that, um, there's a lot of backstory behind any moment. Um, so for instance that uh, bassoon solo, which extraordinarily was played by memory, um, by Laura Light Dowling, which is mm -hmm. kind of quite stunning, because this, this is actually what the part looks like, okay. <laughs> Um, so this is this is actually it exists as a solo work, or part of it exists as a solo work for Axis Mundi, which I talked about in one of the seminars last year. And um, part of the, the the research on that was looking at um, sol problem solving. One of the real issues working with multiphonics um, and and the notation multiphonics, so that they can become uh, that they're much more readable and, and instantly readable for the player. So what I did was look for a class of um, Multiphonics and color fingerings that can be accessed as scales. So they're based on normal um, chromatic fingerings on the bassoon, but with one finger lifted in the in the um, the top half of the of the instrument. So that it means that you can um, you can you can play any note as if it was a normal fingering, but with the finger lifted, and you get a, a very rich range um, of changing colors. Um, from dissonant multiphonics to just like color shifts um, and microtonal shifts. They also shift depending on the amount of pressure that's brought into the system. Um, but what happens is that that's, uh, that creates this very fluid um, kind of um, landscape of colors in the bassoon. Um, and so something like this, which looks quite complicated, um, uh, is, is actually quite sight readable for the for the musician, um, and it's like an array of multiphonics that you, that you would have heard underneath the the baritone. Um, so that's just one kind of layer of, of the work that went into the into the score. Um, okay, so I'm just going to talk now about the end of the piece, just a little bit more time, a little bit of time for um, discussion and questions. I want to play um, uh, the very end of the piece. In Act 3, you um, heard the musicians begin to sing as a choir, and that becomes stronger and stronger as the work um, progresses towards the end. And there's a really great sort of simplification at the end of the work. The musicians set aside their instruments. This is kind of real stripping back, physically, <coughs> you know, putting down the prosthetic of the instrument, the mask of the instrument, and, you know, just leaving them sort of naked with their, their voices. Um, is a kind of the basics of the sounding, the sounding body and the resonances, um, and that for me is a connection to the to the story where there's this dissolving of boundaries, this stripping away of um, layers and layers, um, and it points to the uh, a, a kind of theme of radiance, a sort of a sort of simplification and, and radiance and transcendence that happens right at the end. Uh, in terms of the story. Um, at the end, it's kind of a it's it's coming to the end of the day in terms of the in terms of the um, the narrative. Um, it's the end of the work day, uh, in a sense, which which sort of maps onto you know like a life, um, 
the son, in some sense, confronts the legacy of the father. Um, and again, this question of life in the face of death. This part I'm going to play you begins with him playing with his toy instruments and he, and he says, I accepted the experiment, experiment of life, I submitted to the frenzy, the scraping danger, I endured the urge to joy. So it's a kind of letting go of resistances, you know, resisting. Um, he's basically saying, I could not resist everything that life brought me. You know, I had to just accept, I had to be carried along by life. Um, at the end, yes, you can see the text yet. Why did you not tell me the last secret of the tree of codes? Nothing reaches a definite conclusion. Reality is only as thin as paper. Behind the screen, sawdust in an empty theatre. There's a nod to the um, to the masks of theatre making. There we feel possibility shaken by newness of realization. I wanted a night that would not end. So, so it's it's a, there's a kind of closure. There's a kind of nod to the to the play within the play, you know, is, is it all a mirage, is it all, all a dream? Um, but it's a, it's a kind of open-ended question. So I'm going to play, um, from this section, it's about halfway through the last act, uh, and it is about, yes, it is nine minutes. I'll play that to you. this period of life.
There we go. <laughs> These are the I'm prepared for Beijing, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh -huh.